Well, you know, because uh, Virginia Beach is primarily this kind of skate and surf culture, it's um, a lot of the things that surround the people there um, are valued according to the, um, the, the, the brands, I guess. And so from a very early age, I, um, from a very early age, I was noticing how branding and logos and images on objects created or rather increased the perceived value of those objects. And so, you know, certainly while, while I grew up at the beach and, and, and skateboarding, I was never really good at any of those activities. But what I really, um, I guess, was good at to some extent was kind of emulating those graphics and, and logos because I couldn't afford the cool brands. So I would, you know, make my own shirts and um, paint on my own skateboards. And those objects, in turn, almost ironically, became valued by other people. And so there's a, um, I, I started to understand how that worked. And I wanted to assume that power. Um, and that's what kind of led me to my interest in graphic design. And so from Virginia Beach, I was in Virginia Beach from kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, my father was a primarily a computer systems analyst and was also a stockbroker for a while. And my mother did a variety of odd jobs. Um, and she also made a lot of things that she sold, a lot of crafts. You know, um, we had a garage full of uh, jigsaws and um, sanding belts and tools, woodworking tools. And so I was um, always in an environment of, of making things and creating things and furthermore making things for ourselves. So a lot of my toys growing up uh, were homemade toys, you know, cars made out of um, chunks of wood with uh, milk carton uh, lids for wheels and, and, and things like that. No, um, I guess I, I guess I, I guess I don't. Um, I, I used to do more kind of installation site-specific work, whereby I would go into, you know, a museum or a gallery or, or an environment, a, a space, a blank um, space, and I wanted to create my own world in which to locate the paintings and the sculptures. And I think I, I always wanted to do that as a way of owning the space. Um, but recently, recently the paintings have gotten larger because I want all of all of the um, energy and all the blood, sweat, and tears that I've been putting into the walls, which are essentially uh, temporary, to kind of go into the into the canvases. So the canvases have become their own environments um, by shifting scales. Yeah, you know, I um, everything, all my work starts with drawing, and that is really the um, the root and the core of uh, of what I make, and, and the root and core of my entire studio practice. Um, in fact, not even drawing, I would say sketching, and how I differentiate the two is I go through a sketch process. I'm I'm always sketching, um, in my notebook and developing these symbols and these drawings by trying to find an underlying geometry. So for instance, and, and, and the, 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 the source or the, or the ideas or the concepts behind these um, sketches um, are, are from a whole range from you know something I dreamt to something I heard in a song, um, to, you know, something I read and I want to capture in a symbol. And so I'm always sketching. This, the sketch process involves trying to find this underlying geometry. I get a symbol um, to the point where I've 
figured it out. They're like visual puzzles. And I've solved the puzzle. And then I take the sketch, I'll scan it, I'll use it as a template. I don't convert it, but I'll use it just as a guide to redraw in the computer um, with vectors, uh, redraw the symbol so that it is perfect. And, and so that all the points are parallel, all the lines are parallel, the points are tangent. And so um, I'm searching for one final solution. I'm searching for um, the truth by going through this sketch process and by going through the drawing process. Once I've found that solution, once I've found and developed and finalized that drawing, it exists as a digital file and, with the, and a scalable digital file because it's a vector drawing. And what that really means for me is that it can be reproduced and replicated infinitely um, in any number of ways. One way is by um, having these drawings um, cut out of different materials like acrylic or aluminum or stainless steel and using those parts to make sculptures or environments. Another way is to make shirts. For instance, I like making shirts and skateboards and more product-oriented things. Um, another way, and this is how I make the paintings, is to uh, make pieces of film um, from the files, and then I use the film to develop screens, and then I use the screens to make the paintings. So the next step is to work with a set vocabulary of drawings in the form of these screens. And then I'll collage together and mash up all of these different uh, drawings, symbols and icons into the paintings through the silkscreen process whereby I'm screening paint onto canvas. At that point I'm concerned primarily with the formal aspects of constructing a picture plane, which are shape, form, color, composition. I'm not using these individual drawings to create a narrative. Each one in and of themselves represents something and symbolize something, but juxtaposed all together next to one another in the paintings they turn the paintings into a kind of uh, Rorschach test of sorts. Um, and this whole process parallels and is a reflection of sorts of, of the way we um, exist in the world. And, you know, we have all these different kind of ideas jumbling around in our mind and we're trying to make sense of this chaos. And that's essentially what, uh, what, what you know, free association or, or dreams are. So when we're dreaming, you know, all of these, all of the, all of the input, all these different, you know, symbols basically come together. And so in a, in a way that the, the paintings are a kind of um, dreamscape or a mindscape. Um, it's hard to extract meaning from them taken as a whole. Just like life. Well, actually, I, I don't appropriate um, logos and symbols, but you could say that I appropriate the aesthetic. And so I go through a sketch process to develop each individual drawing. So if you looked at a, a, at a painting and extracted just one symbol, there's a development process that goes into developing just uh, and creating just that one that one drawing and so well like I was saying earlier when I was growing up in Virginia Beach I realized that um, realized the power of icons and logos and, and, and symbols and how they could transform um, otherwise ordinary objects by by increasing their perceived value um, and so I really want to assume that power for myself. And so instead of simply appropriating 
logos or icons that are anonymously created by um, corporations to stand for and symbolize you know any any number of goods and services I really want to take that again kind of that power and use it to communicate my own thoughts ideas uh, or concepts um, and do so with uh, with an authorship that is um, accountable and responsible for that image and so it's a it's a subversion in a kind of way a subversion of an aesthetic um, again whereby I'm using that those forms which is essentially how I learned to draw by going through a design program I learned how to create logos and icons and all of the requirements that those entail for instance they have to be read quickly there's a um, uh, not uh, to not uh, everything. Uh, all the images are kind of distilled down to the essential forms, and there aren't there isn't a wide range of scale shifts and details within one drawing because each little icon has to be reproduced um, a number of different sizes. So it really has to hold up um, at different at different sizes. So there are a lot of different requirements that go into making these kind of drawings. Um, and again, I wanted to kind of as, you know assume that power for myself to communicate my own you know, hopefully more poetic ideas than just, you know, whatever, you know, you would see in our environment, an iconic symbol symbolizing something in a very kind of blunt and um, pedestrian way, because that's the goal. So hopefully, you know, when you look at a lot of my drawings that, again, are kind of embedded in the paintings, you do a double take, and they communicate more than they, than they seem to at first. Maybe I've kind of become numb to it, and I think it was a, a hotter topic maybe five or ten years ago. And the fact that it's not so much, but it's you know is 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 very telling and almost scary. Um, but 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 I think I you know I I believe in a kind of fight fire with fire approach. So again that is the world of course that that we experience in our daily lives and as a reaction I want to create my own world that I want to share with other people and almost as an alternative um, to these other worlds you know so if you could immerse yourself in in my world with you know through all the different things that I make hopefully it could be more rewarding you know and in the end I'm not trying to sell you anything you know just just share some share some ideas well I have a corporation I have Ryan McGinnis Studios Incorporated um, and I've um, owned other small businesses uh, maybe since high school I think I started my first corporation um, so I'm not necessarily against corporations um, I guess what I, more accurately, I think what I would be against or is people's relationship to corporations and corporations' relationships to people, um, even to the extent where, whereby corporations have, in a lot of ways, more rights than individuals. And... I think it's 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 scary when a, when a when a society is set up to give corporations more rights than than it gives rights to individuals. So corporations, in and of themselves, I'm not necessarily against. Um, they're kind of necessary legal entities to and and can and can do you know great and wonderful things for humanity. But I think it's how people react to corporations and how corporations react to people on a very kind of human level that's that's something to be worried about I guess well the Carnegie Mellon design program I assume it still is today but when I was there it was a very um, rigorous and disciplined program and it was an exciting um, it, it was very exciting for me because 
it was so rigorous and it was unlike the art program, which was a little more free form. I learned and took away how to communicate visually. Um, I learned about very concrete, formal aspects of what it takes to build a picture plane, how to, um, you know, use color, shape, form, composition, typography. Um, and I think and what I've done with those skill sets and those tools is is employ those for myself as opposed to employ those for or on behalf of a corporation or an advertisement or packaging or something like that, which is what most people do with with what they come out of a design program with. And But I, I wasn't interested in that. Oh, absolutely. Because it's, um, you know, I think, I think young people who are interested in art, or I mean interested in anything, they're, they're, they're hungry for something real and concrete to hold on to and, and use as a, fa as a foundation. And, and, and you get that in a design program. I don't know if you really get that in a painting program without that program running the risk of being like a, like a trade school of sorts. Um, so I, I would absolutely recommend it for anyone who's interested in learning how to communicate visually. And that's really what art is. It's visual communication. And what I also took away from the design program is this sense of responsibility as a creator for communicating. So if someone looks at one of my paintings and doesn't walk away with something or get something, or if the painting fails to communicate, then it's my fault. And I think uh, one of the, one of the um, one of the reasons why I w make art is essentially because I I I don't like art. <laughs> I don't like a lot of art. Um, and one of the things I don't like about it is it makes, it's alienating, it's off-putting, it makes people feel dumb, it makes people um, feel like the burden of understanding is on them. You know, if you don't, if you don't get it, then it's your fault. And I'm interested in, f in flipping that around and placing the burden of communication on the creator. And that's something I took away from the design program at Carnegie Mellon. If, if something, if what you create fails to communicate, it's your fault. Or you kind of need to retool and rethink what you're doing. Hopefully the work operates on a, a number of different levels. Um, you know, figuratively and literally. The, um, Literally, the, the, the paintings are constructed to operate not unlike a, a, a fractal patterns. So you can, you know, see the paintings and take something away at different distances. And as you go in, hopefully they, they almost simulate the psychedelic experience of going in and being rewarded for that. So you look at the details up close and you and you can um, and there's something there to impart information and there's there's something being communicated very up close and far away and then you know more more figuratively I, I hope that you know the work can communicate on different levels in that I'm trying to make beautiful things. I think beauty is the answer, but I also want to use beauty and aesthetics as a Trojan horse of sorts. So once you get past the the fact that it's a pretty painting and you look at the individual iconic drawings, they reveal something in a lot of cases more sinister or not so pretty. And that's maybe that subversive element that, that you were talking about earlier, to use not only the aesthetic of um, 
cold, anonymous, iconic forms to communicate something more personal and hopefully poetic, but also use the form of art and beauty aesthetic in a subversive way. And I'm not sure how successful the work is in doing that, um, but a lot of times, you know, people will say, oh, that, I, I really like, you know, that, that painting or the set of painting or show or installation or sculpture, and it's, and it's beautiful and it's lush and all that. But I'm curious if they saw, you know, the, um, the specific images, which a lot of times aren't, aren't, aren't so pretty. Yeah. Oh, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know about that. I guess hopefully, if I had to choose, hopefully unsettled, but maybe even with unsettled with a greater sense of inner peace. I don't, I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I, I'm, I'm prepared to impose um, any kind of standard on what, you know, one should walk away from a show with. I, I, yeah, I don't know. A lot of it, not unlike a lot of everything, personally, is in my work. Um, now, what does that actually look like in, in the work? I don't know. There, there are a lot of people fucking each other in, the, in, in a lot of the paintings. There are um, penises that turn into skulls that are um, attacking their hosts. Um, so there's something there, I guess. So a lot of it, I guess. Yeah. Sure. Or, you know, deliberately allowing the subconscious to come through, you know. And it really comes back to that um, initial sketch process where, you know, I'm, j I'm just drawing. A lot of times kind of just free form and seeing what kind of comes out. And um, it's deliberately allowed to come out, I guess. Yeah. Deliberately allowed I'm deliberately allowing the subconscious to come through in the drawings. So I took the, um, again, it's, it was almost a, um, a situationist kind of like a act or act of, or act of subversion where I went into um, the MoMA bookstore and also the Whitney bookstore. Um, and I've always been interested in reproductions and reproductions of reproductions and so because that's that's how most of us experience artworks our art experience is through reproduction you know more so now on the screen but also through postcards and catalogs and books and so I wanted to share my work through the medium of reproduction with or in the context of other artworks. So I reproduced the postcards for MoMA and for Whitney um, exactly. You know, got the typography exact and, um, you know, the croppings and the proportions and the sizes and, uh, and the cardstock, and, you know, the weight of the paper matched it all exactly and made my own postcards of my own work and reinserted those into uh, their bookstores um, so that I, you know, I, I, I could um, share my work through reproduction. No, you know, in fact, even, even like towards the end of the 90s um, when I was I moved to New York in 1994 and, you know, was painting and in group shows and, sh you know, sharing the work with friends and, and, um, and, and toward the end of the 90s, I decided I'm not going to have like an email list anymore. I'm not going to send out um, kind of a self-promotion announcement every time I have a show or do a project or invite people to something because it looked corny to me and it, and and it looked just kind of silly and I'm also very careful about 
making anybody I know or even strangers feel obliged to attend something. And I just, I, I stopped doing that. And I just have since just relied on, you know, galleries and institutions I work with for them to do their advertising or promotion. And I don't have, I've never joined any social networking sites. Um, I've never accepted any of the invitations. And it's just not something I, I'm, I'm, it's just not something I'm interested in, you know. Um, Oh, maybe because I'm a born contrarian of sorts, and anything that's popular, I don't want to do, you know. And if um, and if everyone's doing it, you know, then count me out, you know. So maybe that's the reason why. But also, it's, it, I just don't have time for that, you know. I just, you know, want to concentrate on my work, you know. That's the that's the hardest. That's the hardest thing for me is just to be able to f to work, you know. That's all I want to do is just work. Well, not for me. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly like working with galleries and I like working with really good dealers and I like working with institutions and I've come to value you know, what they offer, um, which is um, uh, primarily management, you know, uh, whether it's it's the management of an individual sale or management of, of um, collectors and buyers and institutions. I'm, I'm trying more and more to get to a place where I'm just concentrating on my work. And I have no problem working with dealers or galleries who earn their percentage and primarily it's it's or it, for the most part it's 50 percent usually 50 50 cut and I have I have no problem with that at all um, if it's you know earned you know and and in most cases it is yeah yeah because it allows me to do what I need to be doing you know I do my part and work with the gallery so they do their part you know I don't I don't really have time to entertain clients or collectors or get involved in, in sales. Um, but I guess the solution could be I have an internal sales person or staff or something like that. But just, it just doesn't interest me. I, it's not something I need to, to be part of my studio practice. And, you know, not being motivated um, by money helps me s um, steer clear of, of that financial incentive to sell your own work. It's, it just doesn't interest me. I'm interested in taking what Warhol was doing with reproductions of reproductions further. So what that means for me is using silkscreen, not unlike Warhol, but using a set number of original variables, all my original drawings, not reproductions of found photographs that somebody else took, for instance, um, and creating unique experiences, not repeating the same experience. So you don't have 50 car crashes, you know, which was a, was a, was a, was a breakthrough and, and, and significant contribution, but that's not what I'm doing. I'm creating 50 unique experiences with a set of original unique variables and the imagery of course is different I'm not talking I'm not using photographic imagery I'm using this kind of iconic you know s universal symbol imagery as well gosh if I answer this like completely honestly it's just gonna be like some corny shit you know it's gonna be like um, I I'm sincerely interested um, in how the mind works and in these um, kind of universal timeless curiosities that man has always had essentially why are we here what are we doing what's this all about um, really kind of um, depressing curiosities that um, 
for me have been answered um, through um, exploring psychedelics. So, and, and you know, you can decide if you want to edit all this however, but I, I grow my own mushrooms and develop relationships with a, a lot of different plants in order to find some kind of insight and answers to those curiosities about why we're here and what's this all about. And I don't do drugs recreationally at all, and I don't, you know, just trip out and enjoy the world here. What I do is go in to my own mind as deeply as possible to find answers and then come back and I know what to do. And I know that sounds incredibly corny, but that's the answer. Um, and that's why, um, for instance, I'm trying to create work that up you know, that reflects that psychedelic experience through kind of the fractal based um, construction of the picture plane and um, one of the things I've learned is to um, create my own world and share that with as many people as possible. You know, understand what makes me unique and then share that and inspire others. So maybe the answer is inspire, you know, the desire to inspire others inspire, inspires me. Yeah, you know, the, the aesthetics are almost kind of the, uh, you know, a superficial reflection of the experience or experiences. Um, they are, to some degree, that aesthetic Trojan horse. Um, you know, the kind of psychedelic colors and compositions, um, I, um, I think are, 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 are beautiful, but that's, that's not the real message. That's not the real content. That's just the, the form, you know, that's just the, 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 the beauty that brings you in, I think. Yeah. This sounds like a cop out, but maybe it's the fact that, you know, I, I never really received a lot of advice. For instance, my parents never steered me in any one direction and always allowed me to, you know, choose my own path and then, you know, gave me, I wouldn't even say my parents gave me permission because they instilled in me a sense that I didn't even need permission from anybody. And, and, and again, they never really pushed me to do any one thing. Um, as, as difficult as that, as that was for parents who have kids who are artists, you know, they, they want, um, you know, some kind of stability for your kids, I guess. So there was always some um, anxiety, I think. But, um, but the fact that they never really pushed me or even really kind of gave me advice, maybe, I don't know, in some way that's the best advice, to not give advice? I don't know if that's really the answer. Because I think a lot of um, young people in any field are seeking um, that permission. Um, you know, whether it's from a, a gallery and an invitation to do a show, permission from, you know, you should be just making your work because you need to make it and then, you know, figure out how to share it, whether that means putting on your own show or whatever. It's, yeah, you don't need, you don't, just don't need permission from anybody to do anything you want. Um, and actually, I think re-understanding that, um, 
for me was a bit of a a bit of a breakthrough at the end of the 90s I moved to New York again I moved to New York in uh, 1994 and I had just come out of this design program and I had to uh, make money of course so I did a lot of um, things in the music industry posters and flyers and um, in music packaging and um, singles and, and 12 inches and um, a lot of record cover design and also a lot of like logos and icons um, while I was still making paintings uh, and I was pursuing both in parallel and I I would have of course um, friends and people over to the studio who would see all these things I've been making and respond very positively to the more kind of design work or design oriented work which for me was always kind of for other people in a way I could just you know make money so that I could make paintings um, but my painting pursuit was based on um, my desire to make art and make things that look like art and so the breakthrough for me came when I realized that I should just stop trying to make art and just make what I wanted to make um, regardless of um, you know how it would be received or, or perceived and so I started to paint the icons I was drawing and furthermore draw icons for myself and not for anybody and draw icons that would reflect and communicate things I wanted to share and sentiments I wanted to share and concepts that I I wanted to communicate and to use that aesthetic that has traditionally been in the context of graphic design made by anonymous people on behalf of corporations to incorporate that into a fine art context and aesthetic and material um, was and to realize that's okay even if nobody's ever done it before and I've never seen it to realize that I didn't need permission that was the breakthrough for me mm -hmm.